Hello, my beautiful friends and colleagues around the world. It's Isabella Lundberg here, the World Messenger, and I'm inviting you for another discussion around, obviously, Leadership Roundtable here. And I have here my co-host join me, Larissa Rifle, uh, which I will let her to introduce herself in a bit. But before we start, I just really wanted to honor everybody and your time for being here, specifically joining in us here on Sunday. Uh, obviously, we have major, major conversations scheduled for you to talk and participate and ask questions and also to join us. We also have an opportunity to um, introduce you to phenomenal guests and a lot of great surprises in this dialogue. The focus obviously it is on our opportunities when we look at what can we do when we're courageous, when we tap into our strengths, and when we're resilient. We've already seen some amazing colleagues and friends joining us, saying hello, which I'm profoundly grateful. Some familiar faces and some new. So thank you so much for Gandalo. Gandhi for being here. Liga, we love having you as always. Uh, Jabir Mukma, uh, Mukesh, uh, we're also glad to have you here with us. But I also wanted to share something very important. You guys know me as leadership advisor. You know me as a global business advisor. You know me through so many avenues of business. You also know me that I am gung ho about people and I'm people champion. This morning, today, the conversation, I am nothing but just the world messenger, passing the message to the world, from the world, from phenomenal people that are, can show us what it looks to tap into your strength, your resilience, and your courage. With that, I want to pass to Larissa. Larissa, who, welcome. Thank you for joining me on this round leadership roundtable leadership conversation this morning. Thank you, Isabella. Good morning to you. Good afternoon to everybody around the world. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here this morning. It's such an important gathering of minds to talk about the situation in Ukraine. My name is Larissa Rifle. I'm the president of the Ukrainian Culture Center in Los Angeles. That is my volunteer job. I'm actually vice president of finance for a software company in Southern California. I'm just so excited to be here today. It's such a privilege to co-host with you, Isabella. Thank you. Absolutely. Likewise, I'm uh, feeling is mutual and it's a great to see what we can do when we all come together. And without further ado, with everybody participating and David and also Joseph and everybody else, we're looking forward to your questions, comments. But without further ado, let me introduce someone who I'm absolutely um, so in awe of how much compassion, kindness, support, but also perseverance, resilience, and strength this man has. He's literally having COVID, and yet he's still showing up with a fever, with low energy, and, and still making magic happen. President and founder of Ukraine now, someone that I've learned so much in the last four or five months since war broke off. And without further ado, let me introduce you to the founder and president. Arthur Killian. Arthur, welcome. Hi, guys. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely have COVID. You can definitely hear that. Um, I'm a tech entrepreneur and the founder of UkraineNow.org. And I started UkraineNow.org on the first day of the invasion, simply because as all of Ukrainians, we couldn't just sit and stare at what was happening. So I'm very, very grateful for everyone joining us today. Um, I'm happy to, to do a little introduction of the organization, Isabella, if that's the time. Please, please, please go ahead. I'm going to share a couple of slides just to showcase the, uh, the scope of the, the organization and what we've been uh, able to accomplish in a su such a short and a long time frame. Um, UkraineNow.org is a decentralized organization with volunteers all over the world. We have 6,000 volunteers that signed up. We have 2,000 people in various chats and groups. We have 500 uh, actively involved in different departments of our organization. We have 60 team leaders and coordinators and 15 key operational leadership people. We are 51 c 3 registered in California and ukrainenow.org is a program of the nonprofit. How it started, it started on the first day of the invasion, we started with evacuations, then with refugee housing, uh, then basically with evacuations of 
um, highly um, complex evacuations, such as uh, kids with cancer, for example. Then we started helping in um, countries other than um, in Europe and Ukraine, for example, in, in Mexico and Tijuana. Um, then we, we started helping with the U.S. resettlement cases. Then we started figuring out how to put our supply chain on rails. We established a warehouse in Krakow, and now we're fully operational and delivering scheduled buses with humanitarian aid from there. In terms of the, the impact, uh, we've, we've done our own evacuations and evacuated almost 4,000 people. We've uh, done 57 round trips across Ukraine, delivered 280 tons of humanitarian aid. And that was just us. But what I'm most proud is the fact that we as an organization, we are proud to be an infrastructure, meaning that we support other organizations to do the work better, faster, and cheaper than we could. That's how we uh, partnered with other organizations like Team Humanity, and we evacuated thousands of people uh, through their network of evacuations. The same goes with Mission 823, uh, run by Sean Sullivan. We also helped them evacuate. We helped them buy ambulances. And we're really, really proud of, of these efforts that um, basically are a collaboration between different organizations because when the resources are short and they're going to become even shorter in the coming months, we have to consolidate what we have to be efficient. And there is, there is no ability to, there is no, morally, we can't accept the waste of resources. And this is something that I've, I've been passionate about since the first weeks of war. Because obviously, the first months of war was the, the, the beautiful state of, you know, everyone supporting, everyone sending money, but it's slowing down, and we have to be mindful about it. The other impact report is housing. We've helped with housing everywhere across Europe and U.S. Um, I'll share this presentation after, after this um, um, call, but basically, this this is just a sn snapshot of some of the uh, refugee cases that we worked on. So as I mentioned, um, infrastructure means that we have different departments, that we are able to use as services for other organizations and volunteers. Any organization can come to us with technology needs and we'll deliver. Any organization can come to us with security, intelligence, human resources needs. Given our reach, and our pool of volunteers. If someone needs some hyper-specific talent, like a video editor, we're able to recruit them um, from our database of volunteers. If someone needs help with logistics or analytics, that's where we come in. One of the projects that I'm super, super proud of supporting is Ida Pomoha. This is a product of Ministry of Social Policy and we have Constantin and Pablo here on, on the call to speak more about it. We've been proudly helping with the technology infrastructure and data analytics for them. And this is something that I truly believe is the international, international innovation of how you deliver the humanitarian aid and help on the ground. Uh, when I first saw the demo of the project, when I was able to fund uh, a specific uh, coupon for a family to buy something at the grocery store and then they used it and I received a receipt of what exactly they bought. That was an impressive feat of transparency, traceability, and proof that humanitarian aid can be transparent. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it down to other speakers to speak more about the project. Fantastic. And with that, such a great overview and for you showing up and still uh, giving your best and, and doing some amazing work, uh, even when you're sick. I just want to say kudo, kudo, kudo for your drive, resilience, courage and strength and passion uh, to make things happen. We have here now two guests that you reference that you're collaborating with that are part of Ukrainian ministry. Uh, and if, if you don't mind, please, would you like to introduce your fellow colleagues that are you working so closely with? Hi. 
Dear partners, friends and colleagues, there are tens of thousands of miles between us, uh, but I feel that we are close and united on our efforts and our values. And uh, thank you for your strong support. The stability of Ukraine, first of all, is now determined on the front line with the Russian army. But stability of the country uh, is also about the function of the state, the continuity of social protection, and the survival of people who do not retreat from the attacked uh, territories or have become internally displaced people in Ukraine. And today I tell you, I will tell you about two ways of humanitarian support for Ukrainians, which are available uh, anywhere in the world. I'll start uh, with the first one. I have uh, some slides too. One second, please. No problem, Konstantin, and it's so great to see you here with us. And for everyone, Konstantin Kishelenko is part of the project that um, are to reference, but also he is working, obviously, to be the Minister of Social Policy, and he is the Deputy Minister. So we're really honored to have you here with us, Konstantin. And uh, uh, I'll start with just one. As part of the United 24 initiative of the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, the Ministry of Social Policy of Ukraine opened an account in, in uh, at the National Bank of Ukraine to collect donations uh, for humanitarian aids to Ukrainians affected by uh, Rus Russia Federation. Uh, you see uh, slides, and uh, uh, when we talk about uh, humanitarian account, we talk about support for different organizations who make humanitarian projects with Ministry of Social Policy. It's about NGOs, it's about uh, volunteer, uh, uh, volunteer uh, organization who work with us together. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, aims or targets of this support, we talk about provide food, provide clothing, stable goods, and pay uh, the one of uh, uh, first uh, essential needs uh, for these people. Uh, it's a small statistic about this humanitarian account. We received uh, uh, more than a half of billion hryvnias and distribute uh, and distribute uh, 4,062 uh, million hryvnia to our people and have a small balance now. And we always need to uh, to ask about new donation because scope of the support it's about one million two thousand hundreds people uh, but now more than six million people in ukraine now is internally displaced uh, in the our territory uh, we have a clear dashboard with analytics about uh, categories of people and categories of uh, support and uh, we have a project with Ukrainian railway company, Ukrzaliznitsya, for uh, fast support for people who are evacuating by trains. It's uh, uh, about food and it's about small money support uh, after evacuation. Uh, you see the results. Uh, it's a product, uh, product, it's a uh, product for people. Uh, it's uh, uh, target support for families with kids. Uh, it's about small portative uh, gas station for, reg for regions with uh, uh, logistic problems. And uh, uh, our goal is uh, to continue this support and to continue the support of Ukrainian, uh, different Ukrainian NGOs and different Ukrainian uh, volunteer, volunteers teams uh, to make it together. Uh, as I say, we have a uh, dashboard. Uh, this is linked to this dashboard. And uh, from different countries, every, uh, every, every benefactor have possibility to find information about support through this humanitarian account. And uh, uh, it's our first project. And uh, my colleague, first, de first uh, uh, deputy minister of uh, social policy, Evgen Kotik, ask for me present this information for you because uh, he is attending today. 
Uh, and uh, in the second, uh, I need to present uh, for you a uh, platform which we called Yidopomoha, which translates from Ukrainian as electronic help. Uh, uh, many international organizations and volunteers rallied around help in Ukraine, but logistical and organization, organizational difficult, difficulties sometimes uh, do not allow to provide transparent and official assistance. We analyzed uh, all problems and difficulties uh, and offered a convenient and uh, transparent IT solution. Uh, and uh, as I say, uh, IT solution uh, we, uh, we call uh, Idopomoha. On this uh, platform, there are three main directions support of the state for people, support from international organizations like uh, United Nations, like Red Cross, like UNICEF, and support from private volunteers, which uh, we will talk about now. This is about di direct uh, P2P support of people and uh, support of the entire supply chain of food, medicine, and uh, fuel uh, in Ukraine. And my colleague Pablo, uh, the head of our ministry project portfolio, will tell you more about the functionality of this platform. Pablo. Okay, hello, my, uh, my colleagues, my friends. Uh, I share my screen. Wonderful. Great to have you, Pablo, and thank you again for being with us and sharing what are you been working on and how collaboration in times like this makes tremendous impact and difference. So being involved in all the projects uh, of ministry, obviously, um, and overseeing project portfolio, uh, you have a pretty good sense of what's going on. So please. Yes, welcome. Uh, so you see yes now. Mm, we're going to be seeing that I'm hopefully shortly, not yet, but uh, uh, one second, please. no problem at all. So thank you everyone while we're getting ready for to hear from Pablo, his perspective. Thank you again for everyone for being here. I'm really super excited to see Joseph, Arif, Sagar, Liga. We're having people coming uh, in this conversation and at this leadership round table from all over the world. Uh, so far, uh, uh, we, I can depict at least five continents here, so which is amazing. And I'm super thrilled that you're here with us and for opportunity for us to obviously dialogue. So when we're done with this segment, I cannot wait to introduce you to NGOs and some, and we can hear some powerful story from everyone. Wait to hear. Thank you so much, David, for helping us out here and also raising up together and being such a great supporter. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being with us this morning. Okay, back to you. Oh, we lost and, uh, When Pablo have a technical issues, we have a promo video of our platform. And if you can to, uh, to play this video for us now, Sure. Um, if we have the access to the video, we can definitely do that. Uh, so add him here. And if it's possible, let's let's see. If not, uh, we can you can tell us a little bit more about it and then we can play a little bit later if that if that doesn't work, Pablo. So please proceed. There we go. Bingo. We are here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are here. Thanks. So, uh, our project Yedo Pomoga, uh, what is this? So, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, three way of uh, our platform, social Yedo Pomoga. Uh, it's uh, help online, help to hand, and get help. Of course, uh, help uh, to. Um, uh, help uh, hand to hand it for people who uh, are near Ukrainian, uh, maybe for Ukrainian, for somebody who can um, do this um, <clears throat> face to face uh, to help people. Uh, but um, we understand that um, our a lot of our people uh, who uh, who could help us uh, they are. Um, in distance, or maybe a uh, uh, thousand kilometers, and uh, for this way is uh, help online. Uh, 
uh, it's very simple it's it's directly uh, help help to ukrainian where uh, you can uh, select a request and the amount of comfortable uh, which is comp comfortable to you by uh, certificate uh, certificate uh, for help and uh, receiver um, received uh, and uh, you can uh, help really you can help directly in this case uh, so uh, we have uh, different categories uh, now uh, the most popular of categories is food and medicaments uh, so a lot of uh, ukrainian people a lot of people in need they need uh, this uh, this one and uh, as a result uh, we work with um, um, <clears throat> we work uh, we work with um, uh, commercial retail chains uh, shops supermarket pharmacies and in this case uh, you uh, directly buy certificate uh, for a uh, person uh, uh, what uh, which in a um, very difficult situation you directly buy certificates uh, for food and <clears throat> medicine uh, that is very powerful and uh, for everyone, again, it's such a new way how they are leveraging technology to help others and, and innovative solutions, even the times of the most challenging um, environments that they're in. So take a look. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a very interesting statistic now. Um, of, of course, uh, a lot of people uh, help uh, Ukrainian help Ukrainian. But uh, also, we uh, glad to see uh, the statistics that other countries uh, countries also try to help. It's United States, Germany, even Vietnam, United Kingdom, Canada, Poland, and others. Uh, a lot of countries, a lot of people uh, buy certificate uh, for Ukrainian and help. Uh, and uh, it's very simple to help in this case. So uh, uh, go to platform and uh, become uh, the phil uh, philanthropist from and select the application you want uh, to respond and click uh, take to work and uh, buy certificate. Uh, some of this certificate it's uh, from maybe seven dollars, ten dollars, or maximum. Twenty dollars now, and uh, for Ukrainian family, it's a uh, really um, good receipt, uh, good opportunity uh, to buy um, what they need, uh, and it's um, really directly uh, help. Um, uh, so, uh, and uh, after uh, help, uh, you will uh, have um, a re receipt uh, report of your uh, donate uh it means that you will see a uh, check what people uh, uh, have bought for your money for your donate uh, you uh, you will um, have uh, sms uh, with a link uh, for their receipt so it's very um, interesting uh, report format of report it's really new mm -hmm. uh, could okay. you explain a little bit more about what the process looks like? So people come to the site, they leverage the site to donate. And then where does the money go from your site? Is do, does this go through a bank and then to the recipient? Can you describe the process a little bit? Uh, yes. Um, uh, money uh, go directly to shops when um, um, <clears throat> volunteer uh make donates donates uh, they uh, uh buy certificate in uh, uh different ukrainian shop our uh, partners and uh, as a result uh, people in need uh, they uh, don't uh, get money they uh, they don't receive money they receive uh, opportunity to buy uh, for this sum of donate it's uh, uh, really a great uh, opportunity for them and they go to shop 
uh, they show their uh, SMS code or link for QR code and uh, spend their uh, donate. It's a very simple story. And how many business partners are you engaged with across? Uh, now we have um, uh, now we have a um, big retail chain. Uh, it's uh, Fuzzy Group, uh, which include uh, Silpo, Lisilpo, Fora, Trash, uh, and Fuzzy. Uh, five stores, uh, five retail stores. Also, we're going to add. Uh, at the bay, it's like a leads uh, in your retail, retail chains. Yes, no, ration, yes, it's uh, true, it's national retail chains. And um, uh, pharmacy, uh, we uh, uh, have our 1000 uh, uh, point of um, uh, shops of, of, of pharmacy uh, retail. Uh, chain um, and um, also we're going to add um, um, gas l uh, line station uh, for people and uh, other different category uh, of their needs but uh, as you can see 57% uh, 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 of needs it's food uh, uh, and uh, um, the second uh, is um, uh, hygiene products and third uh, place is medicine. So we try to work uh, firstly with these categories and grow our, uh, and grow our um, uh, <clears throat> chain partners, uh, numbers of partners in, in these categories, firstly, of course. As the... Um, Continues. I think one of the things that people around the world are concerned about are supply interruptions, right, for the basic needs, for, such as food. So as you consider your expansion of this platform, are there opportunities for retail partnerships outside yes. Ukraine? It's, 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 it's a really great opportunity uh, for Ukrainian business and uh, for uh, people in it because you support not only Ukrainian uh, you uh, people, you also support business. It's a very main uh, part of our economy. It's uh, necessary to support them. Uh, so I can show you next uh, slide. Yes, it's our uh some of our partners uh fuzzy groups uh pharmacy uh, uh charities funds like a ukrainian code help uh ukraine 22 and uh our support partners undp and the ministry of digital Transfer um, transformation and others that is fantastic, Paolo. Thank you for sharing and giving us sovereign insights of what and, uh, people can do. I said that uh, we, uh, now we have partnership with uh, MasterCard um, uh, and uh, it means that uh, they add uh, some uh, for, our uh, for your donates, uh, for certificates uh, and people will uh, and um, uh, we'll have uh, more opportunities uh, to buy some food or medicine. And uh, our next uh, partner is Gasline Station, Vogue. So this is our, uh, our part of presentation. Thank you. And I want uh, to thank you for your attention. And uh, sorry for our English. And I think that uh, partners and volunteers uh, quantity on this platform uh, higher after after this event and uh, if we talk about this platform our partners from united nation development program say that it's solution not only ukraine we can start support ukrainians but by Yedopomoha. but in the next year we have to support another uh, people in another countries in humanitarian crisis because it's a platform is very simple to uh, to scale and to uh, add another partners. We work with uh, Mastercard, Visa, any cards. We work uh, worldwide, and it's not bad solution for every country 
uh, in times of humanitarian crisis. And uh, I ask Isabella to play our video if you can. If you um, let's see, we'll do that next. But I just want to say for everybody, again, watching and listening, uh, this is a great presentation from Konstantin and Pablo in terms of not only what they came up so very quickly, innovatively to, in this crisis that they found themselves all, all, all of a sudden, but then also, as they mentioned, opportunity to help other parts of the world and help them scale and replicate successes where we can really uh, roll out very quickly crisis intervention and support people around the globe. In terms of video, I am not seeing the link yet, so if you can provide, uh, okay, I see that here. So we'll see how that gonna go. Um, just a second. Uh, in the meantime, as we're pushing this, um, let's see. Um, okay. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh, fortunately, I can't because it's not being downloaded, so I apologize. For some reason, it's not letting me not download it once to, to view. But we'll provide the link for everyone that are eager to see, and then that way you can also be able to watch uh, in addition, obviously, to see the slides that they just shared with us. Uh, so right now, let's move to our uh, next segment, and we will bring everybody together for a conversation, uh, but we're going to be adding now opportunity for our NGOs, uh, partners that are part of it to also come forward. We're having uh, some really amazing people that are being patiently waiting also to uh, come in conversation. And we're looking for one more person here. Yay. Now, do we have everyone from NGOs here? Guess what? We're having now, after we had a quick overview from the Ministry of Social Policy and their projects overview, we have with us Dimitro Kozlov, Suspina International. We also have, uh, obviously, Rolisa that's going to talk about Ukraine Culture Center and, and, and change there and what she's up to, uh, my co-facilitator. We also have a Mikhailo, who is uh, standing with Ukraine Foundation, who is also Ukrainian and um, American attorney and also president of organization. We also have Elisa here, and she's working on a really interesting project uh, that, that she joined us here as well, Maria. And then we have a cat liver here with us. My goodness, guys, you are for such a treat. Uh, so with that in mind, let's start uh, with... Um, Let's start with uh, Elisa, please. Uh, could you share a little bit about uh, what, what you have been doing and what is your in, uh, effort all about? Uh, back down in Mexico and Mexico from Mexico City, activist, volunteer, and human rights defender. Hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be here, and I would uh, very gladly share my, my the project we've been working on. We've, wor we've been working with Arthur uh, for a few months now, and it's it's been great uh, collaborating with s such amazing people, to be honest. And um, I'll, I just want to introduce myself and introduce our project. Uh, my name is Elisa Schmelkes, and our project is Ukrainian Diaspora in Mexico. So we are the the hub for organizing uh, the Ukrainian community in Mexico, and we want to build bridges and networks to uh, aid Ukraine any way we can right now, and uh, in the long term, to build uh, solid bridges and, and uh, revitalize Ukrainian culture in Mexico. So, <clears throat> if we, if you could share our presentation, Arthur, and I would I would gladly start. Uh, telling you all about it. Okay, so that is actually a project for you, please. Right, so our project is called a Xolotl project. You may know about this animal. It's a Mexican animal, a salamander that can regenerate uh, its own limbs. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, that's us. Yes, that's, that's the very cute animal that the project is based on. And because it's Mexican and because it can grow back its limbs, um, our, this project is a project that we are working on with the Ministry of Health in, in Ukraine 
through the uh, Ukrainian embassy in Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, first, yeah, about us. That's uh, that's Ilona, my colleague, and uh, we have been working uh, for all throughout the war. We this project started, of course, as a response to the war, uh, but we have been working, uh, organizing protests and sending humanitarian aid and receiving the refugees that came through Mexico, which were like a thousand of them. Uh, we were involved in uh, making sure they had a uh, they had a pleasant stay in Mexico. And, and that's just some of the work we've done. But this is the, our new project. So next slide, please. So yes, we, we want to rehabilitate wounded Ukrainians who have lost limbs. That's what the project is about. So uh, next slide. Um, as you know, we are in a war situation. Next slide. And um, there are, uh, there is a big queue of, of people who have lost limbs and who, of course, cannot get uh, the medical aid they need within Ukraine or it's, I mean, the system is saturated both in Ukraine and in the rest of Europe. And Mexico, uh, fortunately, has a very high-tech uh, prosthetics industry. So we will be uh, working with uh, first-rate prosthetic limb makers and the health system in Mexico is not saturated for that. Demand is pretty, uh, it's not too high. So the Mexican system can uh, rehabilitate these people at a lower cost than would be, for example, here in the US or in the rest of the Americas. So we intend to bring people to Mexico and uh, build their artificial limbs, place them and follow these people through their entire rehabilitation progress process and uh, give them psychological counseling and also just be with them and, and, and be, uh, help them um, have, just forget about the war for a little while and have a pleasant stay in Mexico as well. So this is the story of Oleg. He was, uh, a mine exploded in his face and he has shrapnel uh, inserted in his, in his face and he lost one of his lips. He's, he will be our first patient. And we are very glad to, to receive him. We will be very glad to receive him soon. So this is just one of, of our patients. We have like five or six more in line to aid right now, but we want to expand this project to help as many people as possible. And we're just uh, this is just an advertisement. We're hosting our own fundraiser in Mexico City. And uh, if you guys want to come or if you want to uh, help us, you can also help us there. We are uh, it's going to take place on September 22nd and it's going to be an uh, art auction and uh, general gala for people to donate. So that's it. That's our project. Wow. And we are very glad. to be here. Thank you. That is fantastic. I'm so glad you were able to share a little bit with us here and everybody again watching around the world and everybody that are being affected by war and by mines, by losing the limbs uh, and people from previous wars and conflicts that that I've been engaging with in the past. Um, it's a great to see what new technologies and solutions can really bring so that people can normalize their life and be able to uh, rehabilitate in the best possible way they can. So such an amazing, amazing work and a very important work. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, so with that in mind, we're also going to have a chance to hear from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Dimitro Kozlov, Dimitro, welcome. How are you? You are part of uh, your board of director of Suspline International, and you're doing some amazing work yourself. Do you mind sharing what that is all about and impacts that you're making in your uh, in your country and beyond? Isabel, thank you. It's a real honor to me to be with all of you, dear friends and colleagues. Um, yes, right, did. Uh, I'm responsible for people at the National Broadcasting Company. Um, well, we broadcast 24-7 from the first second of this war. We have rebuilt our tech platform to reduce risk of bombing. Uh, we Some of our regional units uh, are occupied. Some of them are destroyed, but uh, we, we, we still work. Uh, well, um, my company is one of the largest uh, media group of Ukraine is an employer for 4,000 people. So almost um, any story you have heard about Ukraine uh, and people of Ukraine you may meet in our team. Uh, well, 
captives by Russians, damaged <laughs> houses, uh, ruined life uh, and plans and dreams and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I cannot share with you more information because uh, my beautiful colleagues uh, has given us uh, a real widescreen wide story and all this information uh, field is, is overwhelmed with, with these videos and investigations and, and facts and so on. I will try to share with you uh, our emotions and feelings. Uh, to tell the truth, mm, we are frightened, we are scared, we are tired, uh, but we are to fight. Because right the moment uh, we Ukrainians has, uh, we will stop to fight, we disappeared. We disappeared as a nation, we disappeared uh, as as people. So we are to fight by, by all means. And thank you so much for such a great support from all over the world we have here. Well, so that, that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitro. It's great to have you for everybody. Also, for I want you to check Susplina International. I'll be sharing the link to their YouTube page that is providing information in English. There are independent news media delivery, and they're really providing so much phenomenal information uh, to the world, but also for Ukraine. His commitment to provide 24-7 nonstop since war broke off of content that is helping people to make a right decision to really understand what's going on to provide trusted source of media it's incredibly important during the time when it's so much propaganda when there's so many different outlets and where we really don't know who to believe where to turn who to trust and and how to navigate chaos the pain the loss uh, and everything else that is going on and in times like this people like dimitro rise up to occasion in their leadership uh, and blaze the path forward. It's not easy, it's, it's difficult because also his journalists and people that he is working so closely with are directly affected and targeted. And in times like this, I wanted just to say that everybody so far, whatever they shared, everybody plays such a crucial role. But ultimately, if we don't know what is going on, if we're not being able to have information directly from the source and coming directly from the heart and, and telling you the truth, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to navigate that. So not only he's helping with the hope and installing uh, hope in people, but helping them also with their morale. Uh, and a lot of people are sacrificing a lot. The reason I want to just highlight this before we go to the next NGO and highlight their amazing work, which is um, obviously so important to step back and really look at what we're having in front of us. Uh, what this is not about the blame. This is about we're in a situation that we're in. What can we do now to make things better? What can we do now to save ourselves, our people, and then also be able to uh, preserve uh, and have our country back and our country that we can really move forward. So again, I just want to ask everyone when somebody has asked how common men can help, you're going to have a plenty of links here and a lot of NGOs to support and find where, you, where your heart lies the most and then also opportunity to truly tap in and, and, and connect with these amazing people on this panel. So now I'm going to move uh, and have opportunity to hear. One thing, Isabella, really just briefly as we continue, because there's so much great information being shared here today. Uh, One of the things that I would put out to everybody to think about as we're listening about the great efforts going on all around the world is to think about how we can leverage one another and start achieving greater economies of scale in the efforts that we're engaged in. Right. So, for example, when I hear about the work going on in Mexico to help with a wounded soldier, I think of uh, the Ukrainian Medical Association of North America. I think of the World Federation of Ukrainian Medical Associations and how we can connect you to them to leverage even more resources to, to go up against what you're seeing in Mexico. When I hear about the art exhibit that you described, I think of the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art in Chicago and how we can connect that organization with your organization to bring the messaging in that art 
forward. When I hear about broadcasting, we're in Hollywood here in the Ukrainian Culture Center in Los Angeles. There are many media outlets that are wanting Ukrainian content very, very desperately. And it's become so important because the mainstream media outlets such as CNN, uh, Fox News, MSNBC, whatever you call it, isn't covering Ukraine nearly to the extent that it was in the first 90 days. We need to keep that content front forward for everybody to see in order for this issue to remain important to people all over the world. So as you listen to people's stories, take a note, jot it down, ask me, ask anybody else on the call, do you know anyone or any other Ukrainian organization that's involved in similar efforts so that we can have less fragmentation and more consolidation of the global resources that are coming to bear on the war in Ukraine. I love that. And I'll just, I'm glad you took that time to do that. Thank you, and Larissa. I'll, and I'll just double down on, on what Larissa said. Um, I was recently at the uh, consulate, Ukrainian consulate in San Francisco, spoke with consul and the vice consul. And one of the key things that we discussed was the realization that there are so many organizations and it's, it's an amazing you know, feat of decentralization. But on the other hand, there is only so much that the human brain can hold in terms of the list of organizations. So one of the projects that we discussed and haven't yet kicked off uh, because I got sick, but basically a map of Ukrainian organizations to centralize the communication and the point of context. They agreed to, to back this project uh, informationally and I'm looking forward to everyone's cooperation to hopefully you know, enable this consolidation moving forward. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And again, uh, let's go quickly to the rest of the NGOs, and then we're going to open the dialogue and uh, answering some questions that our keen audience has been asking. Um, so we also have here with us the we didn't have a chance to share. Uh, we have um, Kat, and then we also have Mariam. Could you please uh, share a little bit about you and your organization and what you've been involved in uh, so that we can uh, show some of the your successes and everything else. So Maria, Mariana, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariana. Uh, I'm originally from Lviv, Ukraine, uh, but I've been living here in Los Angeles for the past seven years. I'm the vice president of Stand with Ukraine Foundation, and here we have Mikhailo Lavris. He's the president. So if you don't mind, I would like to pass the word to him first, and I'll add my comments later. Absolutely. So, Mikhailo, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Isabella. Uh, greetings, everyone. I hope everyone can see me and hear me well. Um, it is an utmost pleasure to meet you all, albeit in such dire times. Um, so, yes, my name is Mikhail Lavras. I'm an attorney. I'm a political activist, and I'm the president of Send with Ukraine Foundation, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> it's a great organization, and it's such an honor to be here to be able to say a few words about it. So as, as all of you know, uh, today we're witnessing a war of such a scale that hasn't been since, uh, seen since the Second World War. And however, this war is not just on the battlefield, it's also on information, in propaganda, and in cultural warfare directed at destroying Ukrainian lands, the Ukrainian nation, its history, language, and culture identity. So this is the definition of a nation's genocide. And regardless of what else you might have heard on the news, it is a quite badly a genocide. And if well, we know that if Russia won't be stopped uh, and it is allowed to succeed, then it will pr proceed to other countries. So that is one uh, of the main reasons why we started uh, the Stand with Ukraine Foundation and do what we do. So um, we're a Los Angeles based nonprofit organization whose mission is to save, support, strengthen and sustain Ukraine, the front line of the world, freedom and peace, which is being defended by the lives of the brave. So we started as a grassroots movement before the full-scale Russian invasion, while Russian troops were amassing around the borders of Ukraine and conducting their supposed military exercise. Most of the world were spectators just waiting for what would happen next. 
but we acted. Uh, the Stand with Ukraine movement in Los Angeles was the first to call to arms and initiate international rallies, raising global awareness of the devastating impact Ukraine was to withstand, withstand as a consequence of escalating Russian military aggression. So since January 2022, our movement grew to include hundreds of volunteers working tirelessly to raise and ship humanitarian aid, hold cultural events, and engage in advocacy for Ukraine by reaching out to public officials and organizing peaceful demonstrations. Uh, today we are, as we call the number one local, local and global <laughs> movement dedicated to providing humanitarian war relief, fighting misinformation, promoting Ukrainian culture and advocating for policies that support Ukraine in its struggle for freedom. The United States has well over 1 million Americans of the Ukrainian descent and California has the second largest population of the Ukrainian Americans. So um, Stand with Ukraine Foundation has been fortunate to be recognized by many for our efforts and we have been even authorized to uh, represent in, in our field the San Francisco Consulate General of Ukraine. This enables us to have a very wide reach to the communities in California and gauge their responses to the ongoing crisis. So far, uh, we have had uh, held about 35 rallies and creative events in Los Angeles alone, with roughly five times this number across California. Um, speaking generally about, I mean, the, the protests and all the other uh, organizations that are kind of working uh, in the same direction as we are, as we always try to keep touch and be uh, in, in close contact with our organizations that are also doing everything they can uh, in their respective uh, cities and uh, um, their regions. So um, with your permission, I would like to share also a few um, pictures uh, just to showcase briefly what we do and hopefully I can uh, quickly do this. Um, Absolutely, of course you can. Uh, I've tried this in work before, so fingers crossed on that. Um, so if you click on the share, uh, right. you should be able to, and then and I will pick up that new screen and I will add you up in the Please. stream. Fantastic, yay. Is it? Okay, fantastic. Um, so, um, so speaking about our um, direction of activism and advocacy, uh, here are a few snapshots and um, our volunteers uh, work uh, ceaselessly to organize you know, rallies and campaigns supporting Ukraine in the USA and around the world. And we lobby effectively to influence critical political decisions, changing the course of the war in favor of Ukraine. Um, as you can see, we have been collecting a lot of petitions that we send directly uh, to the congressmen and the senators and the White House. We also uh, uh, try and organize a lot of Zoom calls or uh, online meetings uh, with the representatives, again, in the Congress, the Senate. Uh, and, and we try to further the Ukrainian agenda. And it really warms my heart when, when something that we discuss with them directly, we hear about these things actually happening on the news uh, now, regarding our aid to Ukraine and Volunteer Center, um, uh, St. Louis Ukraine Foundation have um, uh, actually established several uh, volunteer centers handling humanitarian aid. Uh, we purchase, collect, package, and ship life-saving medical aid, as well as basic military supplies, all of which Ukraine desperately needs as a result of the Russian invasion. And um, there you can see a few other pictures um and now going to the cultural diplomacy as a crucial part of our activity we promote the ukrainian language and culture art uh, at, at our events uh showcasing ukrainian art music dances movies and traditions for the sake of our civic duty um at, as we are defending not only the territorial integrity of ukraine but our very cultural identity uh, stand with Ukraine Foundation stands for the you know, protection of cultural rights as well, which are essential to sustaining a peaceful and inclusive society. Um, and uh, in this picture you may have seen, uh, we have also started a, a dance, worldwide dance flash mob, which have collectively gathered over 10 million views. 
um, on the internet, and this this dance was made again to bring as much awareness to the Ukrainian problems. Uh, I'm sorry, Ukrainian war uh, as much of the attention as possible. And what really uh, melts my heart is that about a, a hundred different dance groups all around the world have picked up on on this dance, and um, it it has been a viral sensation that it really helps to uh, get the message across and, you know, while captivating attention of uh, folks around the world, we can also mention why we're doing this and what is still happening in, in Ukraine. And um, and finally, for, uh, you know, for all our efforts in, in supporting Ukrainian community, both in the state and abroad, San Luis Ukraine Foundation has been recognized by many governmental agencies and public officials, including the Consulate General of Ukraine in San Francisco, California, and the Consulate General of the Republic of Lithuania in Los Angeles, uh, State Senator Josh Newman, among others. And we have been spotlighted on all major national TV news channels, as well as radio, printed, and online media. And that's also one of the uh, channels we try to leverage to, again, bring our message across and make sure that, that we are heard in what we're doing and make sure that Ukraine is still uh, one of the main main issues that um, the rest of the world is or should, should be concerned. Because like we said, like we all know, Russia is not planning to stop in Ukraine. So Ukraine is right now fighting for, for the rest of the world as well. And um, having said that, and you know, on behalf of everyone at San Luis Ukraine Foundation, I would like to thank you all who serve with heart, land a hand, save lives, San Luis Ukraine today, and make a difference. So um, thank you so much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions should you have them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mihaila, for sharing. I'm just an Ave of everyone so far that shared uh, from ministry to uh, obviously all the NGOs that are represented here and where your heart, passion and continuous effort and how much, guys, look at this, how much of the waves are created here of positive change and ripple effects and opportunity, as Lisa said, as we listen to think about how can we connect the dots? How can we am amplify this? How can we also make it bigger? And also at the same time, how can we help others uh, to rally and be a part of something big, uh, with courageous uh, uh, actions. So with that in mind, um, um, would you like to Marina, Mar say, Mariana say something yourself uh, after uh, we had heard from Mikhail, from your perspective? Yes, well, I think that Mikhail covered uh, most of the our activities. Uh, I would like just to add and uh, all other organizations uh, to work together as uh, some of you may know, uh, here in Los Angeles, we have the Ukrainian Culture Center and Lodris as the president, and we have Artur, uh, and uh, we've been working together. We've been doing a lot of events, cultural events, uh, a lot of uh, other activities together. And I'm just calling all other cities to unite, uh, to help Ukraine and to save our people. If I could add some context to, to this conversation, you know, so I've already raised the issue of how we can leverage one another, right, to achieve more economies of scale in our efforts. But I think that, that we can further contextualize this for the team, the, for those people who are Ukrainian or who are not Ukrainian, but just to further understand how actually if we look at previous generations of Ukrainians who escaped war and communism and, and the German invasion and how that generation of people went around the world, not just in the United States, and literally put together infrastructure, Ukrainian infrastructure, churches, schools, museums, culture centers. They set up numerous institutions all over the world that can now be leveraged for this effort. And so it's it's amazing to look back and think that, you know, 75 years since World War II, that we're actually relying on these institutions to do some of the things that Mikhailo talked about, 
right? Keeping our culture alive, keeping the message out there, having physical locations to hold our events so that we can raise money, so that we can support Ukraine. And so it's, I think it's really important that we recognize that there are generations of people that came before us and are setting us up in, in some ways to be successful in this effort. Larissa, thank you so much for sharing that. Do you mind also share a little bit of Ukrainian Culture Center, uh, a little bit about its history that is based in LA and then what that culture center became today so that others really can understand? Because you also, uh, as you said, you know, that's not, that's your role in your full-time job, being the president of Culture Center and, and things shifted so much, yet you are doing so many amazing things to exactly do that preserve the culture, bring awareness, and at the same time, bring everybody together in diaspora. And I'm super excited to see how this is going to go beyond what we're seeing happening right now. Yeah, so the Culture Center has been around for a long time. It was actually incorporated in 1944. Uh, the building was purchased a little bit after that, and it was renovated by through volunteers in the Ukrainian community in Los Angeles. And really the charter back then was what it was for most Ukrainian institutions post-World War II. How do we preserve the language? How do we preserve our culture? How do we create an environment where we can raise our children as both Ukrainians and as Americans? And to a large extent, I think that the people that were involved in those projects have been very successful. We have multiple generations of Ukrainians in the United States who speak Ukrainian fluently. I'm first generation born here. I'm fluent. My daughter's fluent. Her children will be fluent. It's It was the way that we could keep Ukraine alive outside the borders of Ukraine. And Isabella, you and I already talked about how, you know, Ukrainian independence was largely achieved by Ukrainians in Ukraine. We, everybody recognizes that, but the role of the diaspora mattered. It absolutely mattered. I know firsthand the degree to which my um, grandparents worked to help support not only institutions in the United States that were pro-Ukrainian, but also Ukrainian activities for freedom and democracy in Ukraine. And so there is, again, something else we talked about, Isabella, there is this imperative in the United States to not only support Ukraine and Ukrainian democracy, but we're honoring the memories of our own families and the work that they did to arrive at independence in 1991. We're not going to give up. We will never give up on that. And so the Ukrainian Culture Center, as a legacy of that work, has found itself in the role of not just being a culture center that's working to keep Ukrainian culture and language alive, it's now become a center absolutely aligned with supporting the war and the work streams have been multiple, right? They've been political in nature, engaging with Congressman Schiff, Congressman Correa. They've been on the um, fundraising level in terms of building medical kits and getting those kits to the front lines. They've been about partnering with other Ukrainian organizations who have an organization and have ideas and have people, but they don't have a building. And so we, we work with them to say, okay, how can we put these events on to continue all of these efforts to support Ukraine? We've also done um, a lot of work in terms of helping uh, refugees who have come across the Mexican border once they got here, we know we're trying to help them get settled um, in Orange County. So we've had to pivot quite a bit at the Ukrainian Culture Center, but I think that we're figuring it out as we go along. Um, and certainly we have support. I have support having grown up in Chicago. You know, I can network back to Chicago to ask for advice, for help. I think my my godmother is on this call somewhere. Marta Farion is the vice president of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America in Chicago. She's also a, a board member of the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art and the president of the Kiev Mahila Foundation. And so I, I leverage my network to help give me advice about how to proceed forward with the activities of the Ukrainian Culture Center in order to make it more efficient and effective. 
where they are continuing to operate in a vacuum would not have served us well. And so I'm grateful, not only for all of the people that I've worked with here in California and all of the people that have helped me from home in Chicago, but I'm grateful for all of you as well, because just in this one hour on the call, I have a list of ideas this long about how we can help each other. So I'm super glad to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that and and we have a last cat left to share about her tremendous work my fellow european here uh that is mover and shaker and doing some amazing work and guys if the, she doesn't make you cry i mean uh i was yesterday feeling it uh, when she was telling me the story about orphans she saved and, and and continued to help as well some of the stuff that Arthur also did with orphans and disabled children. Uh, I mean, everybody is doing so much and I just cannot wait to, for her to share a little bit about her work as well then to bring all of you back and answer some really awesome questions and get a dynamic uh, conversation going. So Kat, please uh, share a little bit about your tremendous work and dedication. Sure. Um, so the goal is not to make anybody cry today. So we're going to keep it lighthearted um, for the Ukrainians on here. Privy um, and Doja Priyamna. My name is Kat. So my name is Kat. And um, as um, Isabella mentioned, I am a European citizen. I know I sound very American and that's because I've been in California since age 16. But um, the reason I'm on this chat is really to represent the people on an individual level who might feel overwhelmed and intimidated or discouraged because they don't have the background or experience with humanitarian aid or have as impressive of a background um, as my fellow colleagues and friends on this chat. So about myself, I'm actually, I work in production, large scale band production here in California. I'm in Los Angeles and um, I'm a European citizen who never thought that I would see a major European war in my lifetime. So when the evasion started on February 24th, um, I was absolutely glued to the news. I was glued to doomsday scrolling. Um, it's all I could focus on. It was really pulling my attention away from work. And there was a point where I decided that the time I was spending just online would be better spent on the ground. So I'm an example of someone who cannot offer anything as valuable as military or medical aid. Um, and I, I'm not backed by major funding of any sort, um, but I've still been able to render aid and help move the needle just the tiniest inch. And I wanna tell you that everybody on this call can do the same. And if enough people do this, it does make a difference. So um, I started my journey in Warsaw about three months ago. And um, I started with one of the major refugee centers out there. I wanted to see what it was like. I wanted to understand the needs of the refugees better. There's only so much knowledge that you can gain by watching on a television screen, but I needed to experience and I really needed to connect with these people on a personal level. and. I will tell you that getting to Warsaw was incredibly emotional because I stood in this city that in with the German raising in 1944, this 90% of the city was destroyed. And I was standing in this space that was so beautifully authentic and Polish. And I know that Ukraine will go through similar struggles. And I know the destruction and the devastation out there but I've also seen what other countries have been able to do. And I know that Ukraine will get there. So with starting in Warsaw, I started on a really powerful message to begin with. But from there, I traveled on to Hrebene, which is the border of Ukraine and Poland. And I was there rendering aid for a few weeks. So I was uh, focused with a couple of different organizations, uh, the Polish Humanitarian Association and World Central Kitchen. We really focused on helping refugees cross the border safely mainly women and children, as you know, and then help refugees with their resettlement progress. My plan was never to go into Ukraine because it was dangerous. Um, however, while I was out there, the war really shifted east, right? And so where we were usually helping about six personally now on a 12 hour shift, we would see about six to 800 refugees a day. Those numbers started to dwindle. And the reason for that was when the war shifted east, 
a lot of Ukrainians didn't want to leave their country. They didn't want to become full refugees. So they were moving west into Lviv. And at that point, I decided um, I wanted to go into Lviv and I wanted to see what the needs were in there and how people, um, how the Ukrainians are dealing internally with an influx of refugees. Um, while I was out there, I got to experience firsthand the dangers. Uh, we were shelled. Um, I was there the night when 15 missiles uh, headed into Libya city center. Luckily, all were intercepted uh, by anti-air systems, but I will tell you it was frightening and traumatizing in many ways. And I only had to experience that for one night, but Ukrainians go through this on a daily basis. And um, with this experience and what my message here is, um, I really was able to benefit from organizations such as Ukraine Now because they offered me a networking solution. And from the first day that I landed in Warsaw, I had a Ukraine Now call and immediately started connecting with people. And I encourage everybody to really get connected with this organization because if you are somebody who feels like they don't have experience, this is a good place to start because you will meet people with experiences and they can help you get to the next step. Sometimes all you need is a strong will and some time, and that's enough often. So um, I've now transitioned into helping uh, move medical aid across the borders. I'm still helping people with their resettlement process. Um, I want to keep the dialogue going in the news as this bad news fatigue is set in, and I really don't want the war in Ukraine to dissipate and to to dissipate from dialogue. So so thank you for having me here and thank you for everybody who's sharing these stories because you play such a crucial part in this. And secondly, I also want to help connect people um, to help tap into resources who want to make a difference. So I know Isabella and Archer will share, share all of our contact information. I'm always happy uh, to host dialogue or to have a conversation with anybody. And uh, if I feel that I can get you connected with the right people, I would love to be a resource for you. So thank you so much for giving me a little bit of time to speak. It's again, it's such a pleasure and an honor. And um, just thank you for all of the really courageous and brave work that everyone is doing. Beautiful. Thank you, Kat, for sharing and bringing that perspective and why I wanted to for everyone that is watching and listening and they're still here with us to really see what is possible when somebody just have a will. When is the will? They say there is the way. And for very few of you that maybe don't know my story, I am a former um, survivor of the war, genocide, torture in former Yugoslavia that also had a privilege to work with people from over 120 countries. I know what it means and feels to be a refugee. I know what it means also not being wanted, desired, or another country. I know also what it means to be left, leaving behind everything at one point in your life you knew, your loved ones, uh, your identity, and everything, if you were lucky to escape. But also I know what it takes to be for over three years in the outskirts of Siege City, one of the longest siege of Sarajevo, Olympic City, and what it takes also to sit and wait and try to do anything possibly you can to occupy your mind to do something without knowing if help's going to ever come, without ever knowing if you're going to survive and see the next day, and without ever knowing if any effort you put out, even though you work and volunteer in Red Cross, helping refugees or whatever it might be, is going to make ever difference. And I just wanted to share a global message today from my fellow survivors who I had a privilege to hear firsthand hundreds and thousands of their stories. Every little thing matters. Actually, the little things matter the most, which is kind words, genuine hug, true concern. Do you, how are you? How can I help you? I see you. When we start seeing each other, when we see the name, when we see the voice behind that, when we see the person truly and look it into their eyes, we undeniably connect. And right now, what I'm urging you, all my fellow colleagues and friends around the world, that you're joined, that you're listening, that you're watching, that you're commenting, to really look at the ways deep down in your heart, what can you do to connect on human level and support our fellow 
citizens or fellow uh, people <laughs> and people around the world, but specifically right now in Ukraine that are affecting not only what's happening in Ukraine, but rest of the world. Instead of getting angry or not knowing what's going on and, what, and looking on effect, let's look at a cause and deeper root issue and how can we play a meaningful role? So with that in mind, I want to open now dialogue for all of us to engage. And I'm seeing so many people are asking um, different questions, but I really wanted to ask every single one of you on the panel, how are you coping? How are you tapping into this extraordinary leadership in your courage and your strength and resilience? Where are you driving that from and how you can tell others to do the same so they're not giving up and they're not feeling like their efforts, even how small or little, what appear to be, are still making tremendous impact. Who would you like to start first, please? I'd like to tell just a couple of words, if you don't mind. Please. This war is extremely personal for me because I've got two sons, two boys, seven and 11. And I know if Russia will colonize us again, they will go to Eastern Europe in 10 or 20 years to liberate the rest of Eastern Europe. And I do not want this life for them. This is the main reason. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And, and Isabella, if I could, you know, I think it's it's important to really internalize what Mitra just said. And the reason is, is, is because he's talking about the future. So I think initially, if, I think we all have been in the last 130 days, right? We've all been overwhelmed. We're all reacting. A lot of our work has been very tactical. But if we all took a step back and said, okay, what what can we expect in the next three months? What can we expect in the next six months? What can we expect in the next year? It will serve us well in being better prepared. When when you and I had a, a, a meeting about this, Isabella, a couple of weeks ago, I think one of the things that I talked about, one of my key takeaways from this experience was for the two and a half weeks that those tanks were piling up on the border of Ukraine, we could have been doing something and we weren't. The Ukrainian Culture Center was not doing anything in those two and a half weeks. We lost that time. So as we sit here today, and I'm going to be having a call with the State Department on this topic, as we sit here today, there are certain things that we know are going to happen in the next four to six months. Food shortage. No heat in the winter. With, there's a laundry list of issues that we can be working on this summer that will prepare us better for the winter. And we, we should, as this team, plus more people, should be having a meeting in the next four weeks to talk about, hey, guys, let's not find ourselves behind the eight ball in two or three months. Let's get on those issues today. Thank you. If I could share my story. Uh, so my grandmother, she was born on March 20th of 1942. She was born during the World War II. And uh, when I was a child, she used to tell me stories, frightening stories about the abuse of Soviet power over my great grandmother. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't meet my great grandfather because she did, he did not return from the war as thousands of Ukrainian men. So every time my grandmother shared those horrific stories of her life in the village during World War II, she cried. And since I was a, like very young, I couldn't quite understand the gravity of my grandma's grief. So now as a witness of it, genocide of Ukrainian people, I understand that in the future, when I tell my children and my grandchildren about these terrible days, I will be like my grandmother. I will cry. I don't want this to happen. That's why together with Mikhailo, together with uh, all the volunteers, all the Ukrainians abroad Ukraine, we are fighting this evil. We don't want this to, for our kids and grandkids. So this is my motivation. 
Thank you. And if I may, I would also like to add a few words. So I would say that um, the, the problem that Ukraine is facing, it's not something that is recent. It has been going on for centuries. As we know, Russia didn't invade Ukraine in 2022 and it seized some lands in 2014. It seized the Crimean Peninsula. And um, but going back into centuries of Ukrainian history, Russia has been trying to conquer Ukraine because it is on the crossroads between Europe and Asia. And it's a very, very important piece of land. And also uh, for the mentality of, of the people living within the limits of Russia, it, it is extremely dangerous uh, because if, if they have a strong democratic neighbor, such as Ukraine, which used to be part of the same country uh, with Russia in the past, that is a symbol, a manifestation that people can actually live better than they do in Russia right now if they follow the democratic principles. And um, also keeping that in mind, what also motivates me is that both my grandfathers were persecuted by the Soviet regime. So uh, one of them spent 10 years in the Siberian prison just for speaking Ukrainian. And I know what Russia is capable. And I know that it's not, not some fake pretense that they made up and that they keep circulating on the news. Russia just wants to conquer everyone they can. They just this ruthless aggressor that won't be stopped, won't stop unless it is up. And that's, that is my biggest motivation, I guess. And a lot of my friends and colleagues share the same sentiments um, because it's right now Russia is the face of the global evil. And we have to clearly understand this. We have to clearly make this known to everyone for, for the rest of the world. Because it, it really pains me when I hear some other well-educated people saying, well, perhaps Ukraine kind of triggered this or some other misinformation, which can be very dangerous because it, it leads to this ripple effect that people start questioning whether Ukraine is acting, uh, whether Ukraine is in the right or whether Russia maybe actually had some good cause to invade Ukraine. So knowing all of that, it just, I, I can't stop. It's my main motivation. I know that people are actually suffering in Ukraine, thousands of people, millions, of people are already displaced from their homes and knowing that i know that we just have no excuse people that are still capable of having their normal life going to work uh having some peace knowing that they can sleep and their homes won't be bombed at night not hearing these air raid sirens keeping everyone awake for the past five months almost now in Ukraine. That is my main motivation because if not us, then who? And um, with that, again, thank you everyone for everything you guys are doing because only together we will prevail. And I know that we will. And, and that's just to underscore what Mikhailo just said. If we were to take something positive out of the tragedy and the you know, the scrolling on your phone and seeing all of the human tragedy and the death and hearing about the rape and murder of children and hospitals and schools and literally every dehumanizing act that the Russian army can engage in, they're engaging in. Because all of that is now front page news and because it is clear that this is an animalistic attack from one group of people on another group of people who they perceive to be less human than they are. We can now control the narrative. This is our opportunity to leverage what's going on, to expose what's going on, leverage the international courts, make it crystal clear that this is not just a war for the sake of grabbing territory. If that's what it was, they wouldn't be reducing Mariupol to ashes. So it's we we can leverage this in our favor and we should. Mm. Anybody else that wants to share? 
I would love to share um, about like core core motivators. Um, it has to be about people. And that's what it is for me. And I want to share a little bit about my experience um, with refugees uh, while I was over there for two months and with Ukrainians. So I'm going to share my my viewpoint as an outsider. The Ukrainians are the most courageous, resilient people that I've ever met. But more than that, they are the kindest people I've ever met. And let me tell you, I was um, there when we received the first round, the first Red Cross bus that got out of Mariupol. Um, I was there when we received that bus of refugees. Um, I also received three buses of 90 orphans from Mariupol. And um, the amount of children that we saw that had endured 22 plus hour bus journeys, um, the amount of people that were fleeing with maybe just a trash bag full of belongings. And now, by the way, they're sitting on a border. They've been on a bus. They're frightened. They're exhausted. I did not meet one single person that was rude and that didn't stop to practice gratitude. And that's that's the message I want to share. So in the, in the hardest moments of their lives, I want to show you what they did. When they got back on the buses, as we were moving them into Poland, they would run off the bus and hold you and we cried together and they left with so little and they still wanted to give. I cannot tell you how many Ukrainian flags I have now in my house that were gifts. I got handwoven Ukrainian tapestry. I had women hand make me these beautiful bracelets. But I want to show you this. There was, a, there was an old gentleman that I was helping and we talked for a while and um, he, his house was destroyed by the aggressor and um, completely destroyed and he just barely got out. And he picked up this piece of artillery, which is the piece, which is piece, uh, a piece of the artillery that smashed through his home. And he said he felt he kept it on him because it gave him good luck because he didn't know how he got out alive. And then he gave it to me. And he said, I'm out now and I want you to carry this with you. This is now to keep keep you safe and to give you good luck. Mm. It's incre this is incredible. And I'm telling you, every person that I met was like this. And um, if anybody deserves help on a human level, it is people like this that are selfless and... Um, that are really out to help other people feel good. And so I encourage everybody, show the gratitude, reciprocate, and just show love. It goes so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kat, for sharing that. Uh, again, human story, this is all about human connection, human story, as I mentioned earlier, seeing people, truly seeing their faces, recognizing their names, understanding there are humans and who are they, their stories and what they're dealing with. So when we stop, when we take all the anger and all the other blame and all the reactions and all the different stories and media and whatnot, and really just strip down on human love and look at each other, what do we see? We see ourselves, right? We see reflection of ourselves. And that's the story I've been hearing from all of my uh, survivors that I worked is to rehabilitate genocide, torture, war trauma survivors, rape victims uh, for over a decade. I did a lot of work in Sweden and then a lot of work in the United States. And as what Kat said, it's interesting. One thing I also wanted to say among survivors, people that endured the most, it's so true. They're the sweetest, kindest, nicest people because they know they know what, what that is all about. They know um, what, what it takes to prevail in times of evil. And they have so much wisdom. They are the people to learn from. They are the people to also tap into their strength. And there are the people also to ask for advice and tap into their wisdom. Because how do we overcome this, right? One step at a time and more united, more connected, the better. It's challenging, and we also need to give ourselves break, 
And I also wanted to say now it's me, nurturer and the leader coming to the front. I know so many of you are working so hard today. It's Arthur with us who has COVID, who is not feeling good, who is raging on the high temperature, but he is showing up because he would not miss this for the world and just shows his, his uh, perseverance and desire. Uh, even if he's just physically there, what that means to him, but also shows and reflection of his leadership. I also know that every single one of you are working super, super hard on top of everything that is going on and everybody else that is watching and listening. And I know that we're fatigued from news, fatigue specifically from pain, because we wanted something positive and uplifting. But only thing is, I have to say, I remember in those three years or over three years, not literally sitting, but being, you know, in confinement where I could not really go much far and do many things, I'm always thinking, what can I do? And, and, and how can I, you know, better either my own individually personal life and a life around my fellow citizens or around in my own community. Uh, there was an era before even internet, there was an era before all of the amazing opportunities that we're still seeing and having. So I highly urge one of the ways you can also help others connect with them and offer just conversation hold space for them to share, offer opportunity also to uh, have them to tell you what they may need, tell them what's going on, learn how their day-to-day -day looks like, be there for someone that they know that's going to be grounded, that's going to be loving, that's going to be caring and genuinely interested, that's going to also help to connect the dots, that's going to also help to create a bigger ripple effect. I know the immediate need is always, of course, it's money. It's very important because people always think, oh, everybody is given. We don't have to worry about it. But reality is not the truth, you know, and, and, and right now those resources are really moving the needle as they earlier were showing with all these different projects. Who is going to have a food on their table today? Who's going to be able to get that very important medicine? Who is going to be able to also get that car filled with gas so they can go rescue more people or deliver much needed aid? Everybody is doing so much beyond and above their own capacity. And I also wanted to urge every single one of you is to do self-care. Take a time also to rejuvenate, even if it's just a half hour, hour and a day, so that you can be so strong and powerful in everything you've been doing. And with that in mind, I really wanted to call back Arthur as we started this dialogue this morning. Uh, with a closing remarks and also with a call for action because we can act in so many ways and the best way is to act i will propose to every single ngo that has been on this call their links but also we'll be also offering opportunities how you can support and jump in and be the volunteer and be that actually beautiful beacon of the light and positivity in times when people need the most so arthur please Thank you, Isabella. I think my video froze, right? Is yes, that... yes, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay, you, you can still hear me. Yeah. So my closing remark will be uh, that, uh, rather philosophical, but what gives me real power is, is seeing the power of individuals, seeing it every single day, seeing how much we're all capable of, whether it is you know, getting a, a Starlink from SpaceX in a matter of 24 hours because we urgently need it in, in Tijuana or getting an AI supercomputer from NVIDIA because we have to help Ukrainian government and security forces and volunteers on the ground with some computational needs or being able to deliver the medical aid that just, you know, was impossible to deliver to the region that we were hoping for. It's, you know, the, that power of individual is something that definitely empowers everyone around it. And this is something that, that I want to encourage, just to celebrate that, to be able to share those wins with the community, with the press, with the journalists that, that you know. Because as everyone mentioned, there's less and less about Ukraine in the news. I, you know, in the first months of the war, it was super easy for me to go on Fox News, on BBC, on USA Today, and deliver those interviews. Now it's impossible. It's, 
you know, it's just impossible to break through the noise of all the craziness that is going on in the world. And that's why we have to rely on individuals delivering these stories, the stories of refugees, either here in the U.S. or in Mexico or in Europe or displaced people in Ukraine. So that's my closing remark and the call to action. Of course, I highly encourage everyone to sign up as a volunteer at our website, ukrainenow.org. And thanks everyone for, for being here. Wonderful. And closing remarks from you, Larissa. Obviously, you've been uh, such a great supporter, not only in Ukraine, uh, now.org, uh, myself and, and Arthur and uh, Kat, uh, but also so many others and then being beacon on the light, what needs to be done in diaspora. So we're wanted just to say the diaspora is coming strong, Dimitro and everybody that are in trenches uh, in, in Ukraine now, including Konstantin and everybody else. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're not just extracting information, we're also really we're, we're, we're arming ourselves for the connecting the dots, as, as uh, Kat mentioned, and being phenomenal resource and supporters uh, so that we can get things done much more efficiently, much more centralized, and much quicker because, again, speed is of uh, such a huge, huge importance. So, Larissa, please. Uh, thank you, Isabella. You know, I just want to congratulate everybody on their efforts. I think as I look at everybody on this call, most of us are probably only one or two degrees of separation from what's going on in the front lines. So, you know, the stories for us aren't just what we see on the news. The stories for us are the people that we know, the people that we talk to, and it's a lot to carry with you every day. I think like most of you in the beginning, you know, I didn't sleep very much. You know, I only would sleep three or four hours a night because there was so much to do. And you walk around and you think, well, you know, if they're not sleeping and eating, then I'm not going to be sleeping and eating. But unfortunately, that's not how the diaspora is going to be the most successful. We can be more successful if we do what Isabella said, which is a little bit of self-care, but also combine that with leveraging one another, one another's organizations, leveraging the infrastructure that's already in the United States as far as Ukrainian organizations go. Let's really make the most of what we've got. Let's connect as much as we possibly can. And then let's start having some forward thinking conversations. Those would be my recommendations to this entire group because being, being in a constantly reactive Active state is unsustainable. And I think everybody is coming to the conclusion that this is going to be very long, very drawn out. And I think if we have one another, and if we're forward thinking, we have a good shot at success. Wonderful. That is so powerful and such a great message. Anyone else? I'm going to give you a chance. Anybody else that wants to say something? Uh, Dimitra? You good? Okay. And uh, so I just wanted to say again, I'm deeply touched for everybody's participation, for everyone being here. Please pay attention to all the links. Everyone that has been on this panel, feel free again to share your links and comment with audience and interact. Everyone that wants to reach out to these amazing humans that are moving the needle, they're also on LinkedIn, uh, they're on the Facebook, they're also on YouTube and different platforms. Find them, interact with them jump on their organizations and and figure it out ways and paths even if it just means again connecting dots making referrals or volunteering donating and supporting uh, so again thank you so much everyone and this is just the beginning because you guys cannot get rid of me i am just going to make these bigger and greater and more frequent and we're going to be dialoguing about things that matter so guys stay tuned and i just want to say deep gratitude for everyone on this panel i am so well, rich beautiful humans as a result. And I cannot wait to meet you in person. And also for everyone else participating, for being with us, for sharing such amazing messages. Uh, I just want to thank you, everyone uh, that has been here on the call, that has been also giving us such a beautiful support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank you. Thank you.